Hello, welcome to the Animal Resistance University. This is a workshop by Malek Mihiri about Islam and animal rights. I hope you enjoy this workshop. Also to be a safe space in terms of emotions. Um, if you feel anything you want to share, please do so. All emotions are welcome as long as you're not um, being aggressive or you're not hurting anyone, including yourself, then please feel free to uh, share your emotions. And um, yeah, it's a university, but it, it's not a classroom. So feel free to ask your questions whenever you want. There are no stupid questions. You can ask whatever you want. I would be very happy to, to answer them. Or in, and I want this also to be interactive. So if you want to add anything, if you want to, um, if you don't agree with something that I said or anything, please feel free to, um, to reach out. Um, <clears throat> I want this to be, a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a person that is here trying to say that, oh, I have all the knowledge. Um, it's just something that I know lots about, but I want to share it with you. And I'm also here to learn from you. So let's learn from each other. And I want this workshop to be also very neutral. We're not here to discuss whether Islam or any other religion is good or bad. Um, and we're not going to discuss if the things that Muslim people believe in, if they're true or right or wrong it's what people think what people believe and we're not going to evaluate this uh beliefs and uh yeah and the library gauge is empty and free okay i um i posted a, a link on the um, uh, facebook event for the uh, handout you can either now just uh, Scan the QR code so you can download it and I also put it in the chat so if you want to follow along uh, or if you want to send it to someone else or use it uh, later then you can uh, download it. Also pay attention to the uh, footnotes that I uh, put there. Uh, they're quite interesting. Um, yeah and if you notice any mistake please contact me. Uh, it's still a work in progress so yeah. What are we gonna look at today? So there are let's say four big parts. The first one is about the definition of Islam, uh, the core values of Islam, um, what does Islam or how Islam perceives animal rights. Um, and then we're gonna see some arguments that we can use to bring the, um, or to spread the vegan message and the animal rights uh, message. And then um, we're gonna have a, a small look at emotions and body language since it's very interesting and important when it comes to outreach. And then uh, there are some general topics, some general ideas that I didn't know where to put in this uh, workshop, but I was still wanted to share them with you. So they're gonna be there. And uh, yeah, as I said, questions are always welcome. Just, uh, yeah, write them. And um, as uh, Veronique said at the beginning. So who am I? Uh, I know my name is written as Malik, but it's actually pronounced Malik. Um, I'm 26 and I use the pronouns he and him. I was born in, in Mecca and Saudi Arabia from um, Tunisian parents. Um, they are very Muslim, very religious still to this day. Um, but when I was three, my family moved back to Tunisia. So I grew up in Tunisia, uh, went to uh, school there. And then after graduating high school, I moved to, um, to Germany to study electrical engineering. And I'm still working on my master's uh, degree. Um, yeah, what else? Um, yeah, I don't identify as Muslim, um, just because, uh, so there was like, it's, it's a, it's a quite a long story, my relationship with religions, but, um, in general, it's just something that I don't think of that much. I just don't belong to any religion. Doesn't mean that I don't believe in anything and I have only respect for religions and I find religions very interesting. And um, yeah, there was a part in my life where I was very religious. I was, um, how should I say, I was convinced by Islam and I uh, looked it up by myself. I did my own research. So um, yeah, most of what, what I'm going to talk about today is coming from my own research, my own knowledge, things that Muslim people believe in, what my family taught me and um, yeah. What else? Been vegan since 2014, and in 2015 I started my YouTube channel, my Instagram account under the name uh, Tunisian Vegan, 
and now I'm doing um, kind of, a, let's say, a little bit of online and offline activism. Um, yeah. Uh, that's it, I think, about myself. Uh, now, <laughs> everyone's favorite time, the icebreaker. Um, if you want to, you can introduce yourself, just say your name, pronouns, fun fact about yourself if you want to, and uh, why you're here, just to know what you're expecting. And um, yeah, so if you don't want to talk, you are not, uh, you're not obliged to. So yeah, who wants to introduce themselves? No one? <laughs> okay. Just unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, Lisa, let's start with you if you want to. <laughs> okay, I'm Lisa, I'm from Finland. I've been a vegan for a very long time since um officially since 1989 okay. so <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> um i've been doing some form of activism since the since the 90s i guess in umeo in sweden which was kind of a vegan mecca in the 90s very known at the time um, yeah, but now I live in Finland and do activism here instead. Nice. Yeah. And uh, why are you taking part in this workshop? Anything special you want to ask or <laughs> address later? Uh, no, I'm really interested in how it's uh, like living as a margin, I guess. Like, I think that maybe being a vegan <laughs> in Tunisia isn't that common. I'm always interested in other people's stories. Okay. Like that's the main thing. Okay. Just to let you know, I'm based in Germany, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how it's like to be a Tunisian vegan <laughs> in Germany <Yeah>. then, <laughs> even though Germany is a very vegan friendly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Who else wants to introduce themselves? Otherwise, we just, or you can pass it, Lisa, to someone else. Okay, um, let's, uh, puppy dog, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, my name is Christine, I'm not puppy dog. Um, my pronouns is she or her, and a fun fact about myself, it's super awkward right now because my parents are staring at me. <laughs> it's not really a fun fact, but... Um, I have no idea about a fun fact. Yeah, you don't have to, you can just... Um, and I'm here because I'm super interested in like religions and veganism or animal rights. And I pass to Veronique. Yeah, I just, um, okay, I, I will shortly introduce myself and then we have some people in the chat. Um, so I'm Veronique, I'm she, my pronouns is she, her. Um, fun fact. Um, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and then I want to eat pickles um, and I'm not pregnant so uh, and why am I here yeah I'm super interested in yeah all kinds of animal rights um, stuff and how to improve myself and um, yeah, religion is something I'm not, my knowledge is not that uh, good about religion, so I really want to learn about that. So I have... Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I have Susanna, 
Alejo. She says, hi, I'm Susanna, she, her, from Finland. I've been vegan and animal activist for about three years. I was vegetarian before, but converted to veganism after seeing Gary Urofsky's lecture in YouTube. Fun fact, I currently study metalworking and welding. I'm here to learn how to communicate with Muslims better. And um, uh, then Simo Ahmed, Simo from Morocco, vegan since 2015, vegan activist, animal rights, climate change. And I'm here because for me, Islam is a big obstacle for animals rights movement in MENA region. Mm -hmm. Can I say a fun fact here? <laughs> Actually, I was supposed to uh, meet Simo this weekend in Morocco uh, because there was the, uh, the vegan festival there and I was supposed to go there, but because Corona, I didn't, uh, I couldn't go there. And yeah, I'm now like, oh, I want to meet, I want to meet Simo in real life. We've been uh, talking online for a while now, but yeah, it's, uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And then we have Sana. She says, hey, I'm Sana from Finland. Uh, our pronouns is she, her. Currently, I'm doing activism with Animal Safe Finland, Finland for Animal Safe. By profession, I'm a theologian, so I'm super interested about the subject. I'm at work, so I cannot use a camera or the microphone. Um, then we have Mia. Hi, I'm Mia from she, her from Finland been a vegan for four years. I have not done so much activism yet, but religions interest me and especially vegans and religions. And then we have Laura. She said, I'd rather send a message. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I've been vegan for a little over two years and I'm here because I'm interested in learning new things, especially about veganism. And then we have Air. Uh, hi, I'm Ahmed from Germany. I eat meat, but quite, quite a half of my friends are vegan. So I'm open-minded enough to learn more about veganism. Fun fact, I study psychology and do my thesis about the vegan methods of persuasion. Very interesting. <laughs> interesting. Uh, and then we have um, Didier Daniel, who wants to say something? Okay, that's apparently not the case. Yeah. Um, oh, there he is. Okay. Because I'm on mobile phone, it's not so easy. Yeah, that's uh, the big issue already because I'm far off free, small kids. Uh, I'm the only vegan in all the rural family. That's a very big issue. And even still, to try to be uh, as post possible activist, even especially in our country, Luxembourg is a very harsh uh, country to uh, do. A, this is a very big, a big meat eating country, and every festivities you have, you have these uh, sausages and everything, nothing else. Uh, it's a very, very harsh country to to try to start it. So uh, that's. Uh, I'm here not only to this cross borders of, of uh, religions, uh, countries, but I feel by myself even inside. Uh, you have not to go so far away. Example in my job, it's an institution of uh, European institution. So we have 27 countries involved in the canteen. I even tried to make uh, once a week a vegan meal, or I tried to speak with the chief, the chefs, etc. <laughs> Now closer I reach this, but it's even this still, yeah, we are so many people, we have to accept everybody, and vegan is not uh, well uh, common in certain countries, and it's a very difficult uh, area, how, how to manage everything, and so I try by this conversation to find out even even more ideas, I'm, I'm for five years vegan, I acted for four years already. I have organized some things and I try for the moment because I'm father, I make most of my time. It's an online activism. Unfortunately, I cannot go, not often go out. Uh, that's uh, quite a pity as well. But I try my best moment and try to reach out more ideas and more 
or different uh, kinds of activism or ideas uh, as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank and then we have Alicia. She says, hi, I'm Alicia, also in Germany now. I am vegan since 2014, activist for around one year. Fun fact, my whole family, mom and sister, went vegan together. I know, privileged. Yes. <laughs> I'm here to improve my understanding of what stands in the way of some people in their way towards veganism. I also have seen some outreach conversations and wrong when religion comes up. So I think we all need to understand the background better if we want to speak with many different people. <laughs> yeah. And then we have Oli from Germany. I am not a vegan, but interested. Fun fact, I am doing the laundry in the basement below Malik's room. <laughs> I'm his flatmate. I was religious as a child, but are agnostic today. But I'm very interested in religions from a societal pers so sociological perspective. Interesting. Okay, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, okay, oh, we have question. one more. We have one more, yeah. Hi, I'm Satjana. I don't know if it's correctly from Sri Lanka. Been a vegan for almost two years. Recently, we started an animal safe chapter here in Colombo. Quite new to activism. Attending these sessions to learn more about activism and related topics from the experience. Okay, you're well, uh, welcome to the um, workshop. Okay, Patricia wants also to share something. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, my name is Patricia. Currently, I am based in Switzerland. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, Right now, I don't have, I can't think of a fun fact. Um, and why I'm here is I've never thought about um, Islam and animal rights that much, and I want to learn about that. Okay. Well, I hope this workshop can um, help you with that. Okay. If we don't have anyone else, uh, then let's do the next thing, which is something, I don't know how, how, how it's gonna go, because usually when I, I do the workshop in real life, I make the people stand in a circle and hold hands, so we're gonna try an online version of that, so I would ask you to close your eyes and just take a deep breath and listen to what I'm gonna say. Okay. I want you to think of everything you've gone through during your activism. All the people that you probably lost, all the friendship you lost, how much it got in your nerves every time you go in the street and then you find lots of objection and it's just hard. Think of all the animals that probably saw going to slaughterhouses, being not treated well, dying because we are eating them, wearing them, fasting on them. I wanted to think of all of this. But actually today is a very interesting day. It's 2100 and we have reached total liberation. No animal, human or non-human, is being persecuted, is being treated in a bad way, is being killed because of their spe species or sexual orientation or gender or because of the color of their skin. The environment is also doing really, really, really well. It's green everywhere. Try to imagine how the world is gonna look like. But unfortunately, it's still 2020. And we still haven't reached total liberation yet. 
human beings and non-human animals are still suffering. Their environment is also not doing that well. But if you open, if you open your eyes now, you're not alone in this. There are so many people in here that are sharing your thoughts, sharing your feelings and your beliefs, and that they're doing something for a better world. Yeah. Okay, goosebumps. Um, thank you very much for doing that. <coughs> and um, yeah, okay. I'm getting a little bit emotional myself too. <laughs> okay. Let's start uh, with, the, with the workshop now. Um, so Islam, fun fact um, about uh, the Arabic language, we don't have um, the infinitive form. So there's nothing like to do or um, other languages. There are what we call the roots of words. And these roots are very important because uh, you can build several words uh, upon these roots. So for example, Islam, it comes from the, from the root uh, SLM. And um, by Islam means um, obeying or letting go or giving up. And it means that a Muslim or a Muslim is a person who lets go to the will of God and um, obeys to God's orders. Also some related words from, from uh, this root are words like peace, safety, to take over or to hand over, uh, to receive. And these are words that are um, important. So just keep them in mind. We're going to look at them um, afterwards. And um, in Islam, there are two major parts. So uh, there are, first of all, the six rule, rules of faith. So in order for you to be a believer or what is called in Islam, mu'min or mu'mina, um, there are six things that you have to believe in. So that you have to believe in the uh, existence of God and that there is only one God, uh, the existence of angels, the existence of the books that, um, of which God is the author, the belief is the existence of all prophets, so not only Prophet Muhammad. Um, then we have the belief in the existence of the Day of Judgment and the belief in the, um, in the existence of God's predestination, whether it involves good or bad. So everything that happens, God is, um, yeah, is, has, has decided that. And these are actually also something that might be important here. Um, I grew up in a Sunni family. As you may know, there are Sunni and Shiit. I grew up uh, Sunni. They share pretty much everything. I think in, um, for the Shiits, there are more rules or, or more pillars, so to say, but they share at least these, uh, these pillars. So once you believe in all of these, then you are considered a believer, but still not a Muslim. And then there are the five rules of Islam, which if you practice these, then you are Muslim. So you have, first of all, to, to, uh, to be a believer. So you have to believe in these six things that I just mentioned. And then you have to pray the five uh, prayers per day. And then you have to do charity, uh, which is regulated um, they're in times and, and uh, amount. And then you have to fast in Ramadan and then uh, pilgrimage for those who can afford it physically and financially. It's something that takes uh, uh, part once a year. And if you are able to do it uh, financially or physically, then you should do it. And if we see here, there's nothing related to, uh, to eating or consuming animals. And there's nothing that obliges us or obliges Muslim people to do so when first we see this. However, <laughs> um, okay, there's another slide before that. Um, what does the Quran say? Because it's the, in, it is the major source of information in, um, in Islam. So there is, first of all, the Quran and then everything that the Prophet said. These are the two major things that um, Muslim people follow. And in, in Quran, there's nothing that says uh, you have to eat animals or you have to consume animals. There are some verses that say you are allowed to eat meat or we created animals for you to use and wear. Um, 
and it's very interesting also the 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 position of the words in uh, in in Quran is very important. So there is a there is a difference between saying um, we allowed you to eat meat, vegetables, and drink dairy, and um, eat fruits, vegetables, and eat uh, meat. And most of the times, meat is mentioned after fruits and vegetables, um, which shows us that actually. Quran or Islam is encouraging people to eat more a plant-based diet or focusing their diet on a plant-based uh, plant-based sources before eating meat or consuming dairy. Um, and there's nothing that says you must. It's always you are allowed. And not because it's a must that you have to do it. So for example, it is allowed in Islam to travel. But if you don't travel, then you're not committing a sin. And this is something that I always use. Like, um, onions have been mentioned or are mentioned in Quran. If I don't eat onions, then I'm not committing a sin. Not because meat or animal products are mentioned in the Quran and say, you are allowed to eat them, but I have to. If I don't eat them, then I'm not committing a sin. And that should be enough <laughs> to say, okay, there's your religion is not telling you you have to, but unfortunately, I think Muslim people is one of the hardest group to to uh, convince, but uh, yeah. So what else can we, can we say regarding that? Um, so we're gonna now start with the, with the arguments. Before starting that, is, is, does anyone have a, a question about Islam now uh, itself? just to get a better idea of the religion and um, is everything that I said clear or not? I have a question. Go ahead. Could you uh, perhaps go back to the previous slides? Mm -hmm. Like the third uh, sentence, we created animals for you to eat and wear. Does it say that? It wasn't clear to me, sorry. Does it say that in the Quran? Yes, it does. It does, okay. But right. it also says that we flatten the earth for you, for you to be able to, uh, to walk, for example. Okay. Some facts, yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, I, I don't see any questions in the chat, so... Okay, then let's keep on going. Okay, first of all, I, something that I see a lot in... Um, in real life and also online videos that people, when, when they notice that the person that they're talking to is religious, and sometimes it's very obvious if you're talking to a woman wearing a hijab, the chances are very high that this person is, um, um, is Muslim. But I think religion is something very, um, very sensitive. It's a very sensitive topic, so I wouldn't mention it before the other person mentioned it mentions it. So if the other person says, but my religion tells me to, then I would talk about religion, but I wouldn't see a person that looks religious or Muslim or whatever, and then I start talking about Islam directly. So just keep that in mind. Um, there, and there are two major ways to outreach with, the Muslim, with, the, uh, with Muslim people. So you can either show, show them that uh, Islam is actually encouraging them to go vegan or to uh, protect the animals, or you can also tell them that what's happening today, we're gonna see, that, see this uh, later, um, you can show them that what's happening today to the animals doesn't align with the rules of Islam. However, I would avoid the second way as it, people can get offended. Uh, you can still tell them, hey, what's, going, what's happening today doesn't really align with the rules of Islam, but then people would would tell you, but in my country, it doesn't happen this way, you know. So um, just try to focus more on the on the first part uh, to to make people uh, see that Islam is encouraging them to to go vegan or to protect the animals. Um, okay, and yes, uh, <laughs> remember that you're not trying to change their beliefs, so don't discuss their beliefs, whether they're good or bad, or whether you agree on them or not. I mean, if you want to talk about religions with them, then go ahead. But at the end of the day, you're not trying to change their beliefs. You're trying to work with their beliefs to make them see that, um, that their beliefs and their religion is um, 
um, encouraging them to, to be vegan. Okay, so I think at least in my, uh, in my experience, whenever I talk with Muslim people, they understand everything. Like I talk to them about the ethics, about the environment, whatnot, they get it. They say, yeah, cool. But then they would mention this big topic, which is the festival of sacrifice, because it's, uh, it's the day where millions of animals get killed or get sacrificed um, every single year um, in the Muslim country's household. Um, and it's related to the fifth pillar of Islam, the pilgrimage, the one where we said that uh, if you can financially and physically um, afford then you have to do it or you should do it. Um, and it's, it's basically, uh, so what I mean by, by if, you, if, you, if you can afford it financially and physically, so for example, you, don't, you cannot take a loan to go to Mecca and do the, the pilgrimage. You cannot, uh, I don't know, if you have debts, you should, you, ca you cannot do it. Um, if you are physically not able to do it, then you don't have to do it. So, um, yeah. And what happens, I think it's a, it's a period of 10 days um, and it's paying respects to the prophet Abraham and what he did. And to, people actually react some of the things that he did um, so they, if you, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, so you would see them, for example, there are two mountains that they walk between them and then at some point they run because uh, the wife of Abraham did that. So they're actually reacting some scenarios of his life. And um, the, 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 what you would hear in this period of time everywhere in the Arabic country, or not Arabic, sorry, the Muslim countries is, um, that he was as Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, and uh, he accepted to kill his son or to sacrifice his son to God, and he was trying to do that. And every single time he would take a knife and try to uh, to cut off the throat of his son, the knife would uh, would turn around, so the the sharp side would would face uh, up. And he did that three times, and by the third time, God sent him um, a sheep from heaven to sacrifice uh, the sheep instead of his son. And uh, people would say, yeah, that Abraham was so obedient that he um, was actually willing to kill his own son um, to satisfy God. But what people wouldn't talk about in this time is what happened before that, what happened before God asked him to sacrifice his son. Um, because since we're talking here about this prophet, we should also know the, his history and what happened before that. So what, had, what happened before what had happened before that uh, was that he had a really miserable life. <laughs> he had to flee with his family from his village he uh, had to do really like lots of, of hard stuff. And by the time God asked him to kill his son, he didn't have anything else. He didn't have uh, money. He was in the middle of nowhere. He didn't even have um, water. He didn't have any help. He basically only had his wife and his son. Um, so, and every single time he would ask, uh, God for help, God would help him and um, to show his gratefulness, uh, God asked him to kill his son. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. No, 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 no. So yeah, killing the son was a sign of, of complete obedience and this is like the thing that people talk about. Um, but do actually Muslim have to kill animals? So first of all, the pilgrimage, you can do it only once in your life. You don't have to do it every single year. Um, yeah, I talked about that. Also, these practices that people do are very symbolic. So why don't we also take the, 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 the act of sacrificing the sun as a symbolic act? And before sacrificing an animal, why don't we sacrifice also as Abraham did since we are following him that uh, we sacrifice our energy, our time, our money before we kill an animal. So why don't we, for example, do some charity or do some community work or help others with 
something big or whatever. And maybe instead of um, killing an animal because you have also to donate a big part of that animal to poor people, maybe before killing an animal, maybe just uh, donate some plant-based food because for the same amount of money that uh, you would, that, that would cost you for, for a sheep or for whatever animal you're killing, you can donate much more plant-based food. And this is, these are, this is the argument that I would bring up. I would ask them, hey, if you are following Abraham, why don't you follow him to the fullest and really sacrifice everything before you sacrifice an animal? Also something that, a question that um, I would ask in general is, a Muslim believes also in the day of judgment. Let's say the day of judgment, you're standing uh, before God and God is asking you, why didn't you sacrifice an animal? And then you tell God, hey, I didn't want to harm an animal. I didn't want to ruin the environment, my health. So instead of sacrificing an animal, I sacrifice my time, energy and money and I donated other things. Uh, would you think that God would be mad at you? And this is a question most of the people would say actually no, but they might say also yes, then you can maybe just play a little bit more on their, on their emotion. But um, so these are the two things that I usually say that if you want to follow him, then follow him to the fullest. And uh, would you think that God would be mad at you because you didn't sacrifice an animal? Yeah. Any questions so far or anything to add here? or to disagree with. <laughs> uh, Malek, it's Thorsten here. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, so, but in the pilgrimage, the, the standard would be that part of the pilgrimage, you would sacrifice an animal. That's the traditional way to do it. Um, so it's, I, I think it's the last day of the pilgrimage. So it says that it's, ten, it's a 10 day period of time where people go to Mecca to do all of these uh, practices. And then at the last day, they uh, would uh, sacrifice the animal. But also people who don't do the pilgrimage can do it at home. So they can sacrifice an animal at home. Did I answer your question? Yes, because I would expect if people, it seems it's all, you know, it's very based on tradition. So if that's the normal way, it, it takes quite a bit to sway somebody from saying that's how it's been done in the past, but it's no longer required, right? So can you argue also that times have changed and what maybe was an acceptable tradition in the past is no longer acceptable today? Or is that difficult with uh, Muslims to argue? Islam uh, is a little bit tricky when it comes to this point, unfortunately. It's not, um, how should I say it? Uh, it's not as flexible as other religions. So there have, there has, mm, been no kind of a reform in the religion because Islam says that it's valid for um, everywhere and every time. So people are, don't really, there's no reform in Islam. What people think nowadays or do is based on what people did in the past. Um, I mean, you can argue with them if the person you're talking to is probably a, a, is maybe a person who who can see a reform in Islam, maybe then you can tell them what they did in the past is not valid anymore. You can still use that. Uh, but in general, Islam is not as flexible when it comes to, to this. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, we have AR saying it's a sh choice of our free will to eat and wear animals. Is Islam says no human can be forced to do something and Islam says every animal is going to heaven. And Susanna asks, uh, she's curious, how did you become vegan? Okay, wait a second. It's just of our free will to eat and wear animals. Um, Islam says no human can be forced to do something and Islam says every animal is going to heaven. Yeah, but do you want to be the cause of their death? Because as you also know, in the day of judgment, animals are going to also take revenge of everything that happened to them. So it also says in Islam, if a, if a lion eats a gazelle, then the gazelle is going to also take revenge of the lion uh, in the day of judgment. So do you want to be, do you really want to be in that position? I don't know. And yeah, it's a choice, but where's the choice of the animal? Think about the choice of the animal. Do, does the animal want to be killed? I don't know. 
I'm just curious how we become vegan. Actually, um, yeah, story time. Um, I was very ignorant and I didn't know anything about um, veganism. I didn't even know uh, the term. I grew up as a side Muslim, so I, I participated also in the slaughter of animals. I uh, went to the butcher pretty much every week and I, and I watched how they killed uh, um, um, chickens. Um, and I was very interested in seeing that. I also grew up on the sea. So fishing was the, the summer activity for me. And then uh, I was friends with someone on Facebook who, was, who had a crush on a vegetarian girl. And then he was posting uh, some articles about veganism and vegetarianism. And then I saw the word vegan. I didn't know about it. I clicked on the article. It made sense. I became vegan right away. So it just took me 30 minutes after knowing the word vegan to go vegan. And it's been now six years. Yeah. For as for all solutions, they are beautiful, but Islam is interpreted in a way that the Prophet Muhammad and his companions live, not a new interpretation, unfortunately. Yes, and I think this is what we what we have to do, uh, what we have to work with. We have to work with what people believe in, not what people should believe in. Does sacrifice also mean to eat the animal? Um, good question. I wouldn't say so because um, by, by sacrificing the animal, it's just saying, it's symbolic for saying, I would kill my, uh, my son or my daughter or someone that I love to, uh, to satisfy God. But instead of killing them, I'm sacrificing this animal and I'm also donating a big part of it. Um, yeah. Also something maybe interesting, only the person who is um, affording their family life um, is supposed to uh, to sacrifice. So if let's say a family of five, they're all living together, let's say the father is working and he's affording for his family, then they, it's not that they have to kill five animals, they would kill only one animal. Uh, and let's say then one of the three children got married and has uh, their own um, uh, family, then they aren't um, supposed to also sacrifice an animal. But yeah, also something very interesting, it's, it doesn't say anywhere that you have to do it. Um, it's encouraged to do it, but there is also even in the, in the sayings of the prophet, um, you... <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Okay, so no further question, then we can keep on going. Okay, meat, <laughs> it's, it's uh, still related to, um, to, to, to uh, festival of sacrifice. The question that I mentioned before um, about uh, whether you think God would be mad at you because you didn't eat animals I, uh, uh, or didn't sacrifice animals and also use it uh, for meat, I would ask them, do you think that God would be mad at you because you didn't eat any meat? Um, and as we said, it's not a must anyways. But we cannot talk about meat without talking about halal. So who knows what halal is and where, what, it, what it means or what it means for you? Are you familiar with it? Uh, humane? Um, maybe? <laughs> I'm not sure that it means the same, but uh, we're going we're gonna to have a look at the rules of, uh, of, um, of halal. So um, it should be humane. It should be. Uh, okay, Peter, you want to say something? All right. I, 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 I was just, um, I think it means legal and um, if I can't, cont and with relation to food, then it would mean like there's no alcohol in it. Um, yeah, that's and, correct. Yeah. And it would mean that the animals were killed in a certain way, but I don't know the exact details of that. Because I used to think it meant that the animals weren't stunned, but then I learned that there is halal stunning of 
of animals, so then it got very confusing, and then I stopped reading about it. <laughs> um, are you in the UK? Yeah. Okay, interesting, because uh, we're going to talk, uh, thank you for bringing that point, because I didn't think about sunning, because actually it's not allowed in Islam, as far as I know, but then uh, someone in the UK said that um, now it's okay, because uh, they have to confined with the rules in the UK. So now they're also uh, stunning the animals, but actually in Islam, you shouldn't stun the animal. Yeah, that's what I thought. Exactly. It's just, that's why I asked if you were in the UK, because uh, that's something that, um, as, far, as, as far as I know, only happens in the UK. Okay. Uh, Eve says, many times a Muslim would respond to the slaughterhouse videos uh, as they think this is wrong, but they kill animals in a special way. Uh, it's a priest for, it's prayed for a priest. Yeah. So what you said is actually not wrong, but halal means in general, it's Arabic for allowed. So it's not only related to food, it's everything that a Muslim person um, uh, is allowed to do or wear or whatever. Um, it just literally means allowed. And when it comes to food, it's a, it's a little bit tricky here because in Quran, it only says that uh, no alcohol, although that's very debatable, and then uh, no blood, no suffocated animals, no pork, no dead animals, unless they are from the sea. Um, and these are the big things when it comes to food that are mentioned in the Quran. Um, but there are lots of rules about uh, uh, the halal slaughter or the allowed, or the way that it's allowed to kill animals in Islam. Uh, and they're not really written anywhere. So they're not mentioned in Quran. They are probably mentioned in the, in the sayings of the, of the Prophet. Um, but it's what I'm going to list here. Uh, these are things that every how should I say uh, they align with the rules of Islam. It was a little bit difficult a couple of years ago to really look in, uh, uh, in all of the um, uh, uh, sources. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, when it comes to oops. When it comes to uh, to slaughtering an animal, okay, here we go. Uh, oh, I missed something there. Okay, so uh, animals are not allowed to uh, to be killed in front of other animals. Uh, the animals are not allowed to to see the knife that you're gonna kill them with. Um, hmm. Okay, something was missing there, but uh, yeah, the knife has to be really sharp and you only have you're only allowed to do one stroke so you cannot just go back and forth on an animal um and yeah the animal the animals are not allowed to be tied up or to be hanged um so you have to put them on their side gently you don't you're not allowed to uh, uh, tie their uh, uh, legs up so you can pull the, the the rope and then they would fall um and if you put the if you put the animal on their side and they're facing they should they should be facing Mecca and the animal stands up then it's actually forbidden to kill the animal um, also animals are only to be killed by man so women are not allowed to kill animals or to uh, to slaughter animals in, in Islam um, what else can we add here uh, these are the 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 basic ones also the whole idea of this is that um, animals have to be treated well from birth to, to slaughter so um, for example forcibly impregnating animals to reproduce or to to force them to mate um, I don't think that it's something uh, that uh, really aligns with the rules of Islam and we know what's happening today in the animal industry and it's not really that different in in Muslim countries or, or countries where um, Islam is, is, is that spread. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Do you think that what we, that these rules or what's happening today in the animal industry is aligning with the rules of Islam. Okay. Okay. Also, something else here. Um, 
if you're talking to a person about Islam and then you ask them, okay, what are the rules of uh, halal slaughter? Usually they would tell you, you have to, the animal should be facing towards Mecca and then you have to say a prayer and then kill the animal and then you're good. So these are the major rules that people would say and they would, for some reason, forget about the rest, about the not uh, hanging the animal, um, the animal shouldn't see the knife, the animal shouldn't be seeing any other animal being killed or so on. So if you're talking to someone and then you're talking about the, the rules of halal when it comes to slaughter, maybe take a little bit of your time and make them go through all of this. Uh, also, something very important in Islam, if you're not sure about something, whether it's, it's uh, uh, halal or not, you should probably avoid it. And these rules are really are quite difficult because the idea behind it is that the animal has to sacrifice themselves. The animal should be somehow willing to get killed. Um, and just by that, it's a little bit hard to fulfill. So why would you take a risk if, if these rules are quite hard to fulfill? Okay, before we go to Dari, any questions here? Patricia asks, uh, why is pork not eaten? <laughs> um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, there are lots of, in, in Quran, it doesn't say anything about that, like why you shouldn't uh, uh, eat pork. Um, there are lots of things that I heard from, uh, they are dirty, they could kill human beings, so you shouldn't eat them because they eat meat also, I don't know. Because most of the times only herbivorous animals are allowed in Islam, but not all of them. So I don't really know why. I don't know if someone, uh, maybe Simo or someone else, if they have a response for that, please share it with us. And then Christine has a question. Yeah. Yeah, can you go back one slide again? Here? Um. Is it forbidden to kill the animal? We're losing you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, could you repeat your question? Is it forbidden to kill if they stand up? So is it for all to kill all or just on this day? We cannot hear you, so could you maybe type your question? Veronica, are you still looking at the, the questions? So Christine says, uh, asks, is it forbidden to kill the animal at all when they stand up during the process or at all or just on this day, for example? Um, these, are, these are the rules, um, the general rules, not only on that day. And this is meat in general, so killing animals in general. And then AR says, my father told me it is forbidden to slaughter animals if they are, if they are younger than six months. That is also correct. There is a, a certain age that the animal should reach before being uh, slaughtered. But I don't know the exact age. I think it's different. But yeah, you are correct. And then I have a question. Um, so uh, if they are being slaughtered, halal, um, do they 
is it by uh, men or do they use machines or is it by hands? Um, is it what is happening today or the rules? How do they, how do they slaughter them with machines? Is it like automa uh, optimized or is it by hands? There are both ways. Uh, both. You, can, you can find both uh, ways today in most of the Muslim countries. I've seen both, but at least I think most of the time they're killed by men. Um, but there are also some, uh, um, how they're called? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't find the word, but anyways, like these uh, modern, modern uh, slaughterhouses. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I don't see any more questions. Okay. Then let's go to dairy, which is something that really annoys me because apparently the Prophet Muhammad drank lots of milk and he was asking God to, um, to give him more milk or to give humanity more milk. Um, and people just follow him and drink lots of dairy or eat uh, 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 eat dairy product because they think that they're following him and that they're doing a good thing. Um, but we should say that the Prophet Muhammad had his own animals um, and he was also known for taking care of his animals. He even had a cat and he was taking care, to, uh, care of her. So I don't know how uh, he was getting milk, but I don't think it's the same way that it's happening today, but that's not the point. The point is that there are also uh, halal rules for dairy, and I guarantee you that 99% of Muslim people don't think about that and don't know it because no one talks about it. Although the rules are very simple, and very straightforward, and everyone can... What happened here? Okay, can you still hear me, see me, see my screen? Okay, yes. I don't know what yeah, we can see you. I don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, sorry for that. So um, yeah, uh, milk can only be consumed when the baby animal um, had enough milk. And, um, and if the mother still has milk, so if the baby has gotten enough, then you are uh, allowed to take the rest. And of course, the pregnancy has to happen uh, naturally. Uh, so nothing like forcing the animal to, um, uh, like forcibly impregnating them or what also uh, is done now um, in smaller farms in the Arabic or at least in Tunisia, in my city, what they would do is they would put the, um, a cow and a bull in a room and somehow force them to make. Um, yeah, so this is something that really annoys me because no one talks about that. No, no one really talks about the, the rules of halal when it comes to dairy. Um, and to be honest, I don't really know why. Like you would hear even at school, they would teach you the rules of halal when it comes to meat, but they wouldn't talk about, uh, about dairy. And even nowadays, if you Google uh, halal, dairy, whatever, they would talk about the additives, if the additives that they put there are halal or not, but rather than that, uh, they wouldn't talk about dairy. Um, yeah. Any questions or anything to add here? Okay, so. Okay, I didn't even know what halal had any meaning when it comes to dairy. They have spoken about halal with people quite a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, hello, Beam. Yeah, it's been going now for an hour, more or less. Okay, if there are no questions, then let's just uh, keep on going. Or does anyone have a question or anything to add here? Um, yes, the, 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 this uh, talk is being recorded. So it will be uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel, so you can rewatch it. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Um, oh, Peter um, had a question. Okay. Uh, what do you know? What kinds of milk that 
God drunk? Like from no. what animals? Good question. Uh, usually, uh, um, uh, uh, cows and goats, these are the ones that uh, you could drink the milk of. I cannot think of any other animal that you can, that is allowed in Islam. I think only these two. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Now, everything else that I didn't mention, so X for circular zoos and animal testing. Um, unfortunately, there are no explicit rules about these topics um, in Islam. They're not really talked about, um, but you could probably see that the rules of halal are actually trying to protect the animals, are trying to, yeah, make it humane for them. So shredding and uh, uh, um, chicks alive, I don't think that this is something that Islam would agree with. However, there are two stories that I want to share with you, and these are stories that uh, you would hear a lot in Muslim countries. You would hear them a lot even in mosques and all of that, and they would give us an idea about, um, about how Islam perceives animals. So the first story is that uh, there was a man that was just uh, walking down the street, and he uh, found a, a dog that was thirsty and couldn't uh, go in the fountain because it was uh, a little bit deep. So what he did was he took his shoes off and he went in the fountain and he filled his, uh, his shoes with water and gave them to, uh, and gave it to the animal, to, to the dog. And uh, this person went directly to heaven because he helped the dog just by giving him water. Um, and there was a woman that directly went to uh, to hell because she imprisoned the cat. She didn't allow her to look for food by herself and she didn't give her food. Uh, and that's why she just went directly to hell. And I think this gives us an idea about, um, about Islam and how it perceives animal rights. And also something um, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a core value in Islam um, and something that people, again, they would mention a lot is that you should be uh, that you should be merciful and show mercy uh, upon everyone on earth so the one in the sky is uh, has mercy on you and that for me at least it also uh, involves animals so we have to be good to all animals and all other beings on this earth so the one in the sky aka god can be also merciful um, on us um Veronique, by the way, if there is any question, you can just interrupt me. Don't wait for me, okay? <laughs> um, I mean, when I finish a slide or finish a sentence or something. Um, okay. Fish and other sea animals. This is also uh, something a little bit tricky because, uh, as I said uh, earlier, all sea animals are allowed in Islam, even if they're dead. So if you're on the beach and then you saw a dead fish, you are allowed to eat the, the fish. Um, there are no rules about how to kill the fish, how to, um, to fish the fish. There's nothing that, um, that talks about that. And usually um, I use two arguments. The first argument would be uh, emotional. So let the person know that um, marine animals do have feelings and feel pain like any other animal. Um, we don't really have to talk about that. This is, this is proven and we can also see it. Um, and we know that Islam is also encouraging Muslim people to be good to animals. So letting an animal suffocating and, and just dying that way wouldn't be that nice. And the second one is the environment. Um, we know that the fish industry is really destroying uh, earth and we're heading towards that seas. So um, I'm going to talk now in a minute about the, um, how Islam perceives the environment. So we're going to also base our knowledge about environment also with how Islam perceives it. But these are the two major um, arguments that um, I would use. So this was pretty much the, the ethical, let's say, uh, part of, of the arguments. 
and then we're going to look also at the environment and the health. But before we do that, uh, let's just um, talk about this. Uh, if anyone has anything to add or question or whatever um, before I move. Yes, AR says Prophet Mohammed loved cats. In Turkey, for example, cats can enter the mosques and don't get harmed. Yeah, I heard the story lately uh, where uh, a cat, so the Prophet was apparently praying and then a cat entered and uh, she went on his back and he kept, he stayed there until she went off because he didn't want to disturb her or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure how true this story is. Uh, Patricia asks, uh, I'm wondering, due to all these rules, are meals largely, plant, largely plant-based? Are what? Excuse me again? Are they, are the, due to all the rules, are meals largely, largely plant-based? Um, are they mostly plant-based or? Unfortunately not. <laughs> unfortunately not. Um, animal products are seen in, I think it's it's more of a cultural thing when you talk about about food. Um, yeah, um, the at least in Tunisia, I can only talk of Tunisia. In Tunisia, we still eat lots of of meat. I think the average meat consumption is about thirty five kilos per person. So people are still eating meat and dairy, and veganism is not spread that much, even vegetarianism. So unfortunately, also although we have all of these rules, people eat. Um, uh, animal products. Yeah. And um, Robin says, I still had a question about dairy. Does Islam anything, uh, does Islam say anything about um, male babies? For example, is it allowed to kill them because they won't produce milk or do they have to be raised first? Um, I would say they have to because, because the point that someone uh, mentioned earlier that you're not allowed to kill baby animals you, you are only allowed to kill them starting from a certain age so I would say that uh, yeah you shouldn't kill them a couple of days afterwards you should wait you raise them and then kill them the halal way yeah I, I also have a question about that personally um, if uh, the baby uh, if if animals have to be a certain age to be slaughtered mm -hmm. um how does it work then because they because muslim e eat um chickens and they're like only six weeks yeah that's why it depends on the animal uh but that's something very interesting that i have to look up myself um but yeah the animals should reach a certain age which age I don't really know, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe I will, I will look that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then Lisa has a question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just might have missed this if you addressed it before. It's about dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, is there certain brands of uh, milk and cheese that are halal? Or do Muslims buy like regular milk from stores? Um, I haven't seen any milk brand that had the halal um, uh, stamp on it or label. Um, as I said, usually when, when now, if you Google halal milk or whatever, they would talk about the additive that they put in the milk, not the process of milk, because as I said, Muslim people don't really think about the halal rules when it comes to dairy, so they just drink dairy. And uh, I remember when I first moved here, I was still uh, um, identifying as Muslim. So when I moved in Germany, I just drank the milk here. I didn't eat the meat from regular supermarkets. I bought halal meat, but um, as far as I know, there are no big brands, at least, that promote themselves as, as halal uh, dairy. Usually, halal uh, dairy is just perceived as halal by itself. Did I answer your question? Okay, great. And then uh, AR says, male and female babies have to live six months. In Islam, it is forbidden to kill animals under six months. If there exist special rules for chicken, I don't know. 
Yeah, then it's going to be tricky. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for that information. It's going to be then tricky with chicken because I think uh, they're killed after a couple of weeks, right? So yeah, six weeks normally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to look that up myself. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter has a question. Um, considering that with regards to what's halal and haram, and considering you said you were only really taught about like what could be added to milk and stuff, how did you find out about these rules? regarding like the dairy industry and what's allowed and not allowed? <laughs> it took lots of research and also some reasonable thinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because these, I think I heard it once somewhere, but I didn't really think about it that much. And then when I went vegan and I started also doing this, uh, this workshop, I had to dig it in and see where, where it was. Um, so it's something that uh, um, I, I, to be honest, I don't remember where exactly I found it, but even without that, when you know Islam and when, uh, when, when, you, when you know how Islam functions, how it perceives animals, having this rule about dairy is not a, is not a surprise. Yeah. Something that if you tell it to someone that uh, uh, have never heard of halal rules when it comes to dairy, I think they would I would, they would say, oh yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Because I mean, try to man, I don't think that Islam would be happy about someone putting their, their arms in the anus of a, of a, of a cow and then imp and injecting semen in, in yeah. you know, so I think it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And then there's another a comment or question. Um, Sorry, but for what pigs is not allowed, God says the Jews, the Christians, the granddaughter of monkeys, and pigs and the Jew and Christians, the enemies of Islam. Um, actually, Islam says, it's very interesting. Okay, uh, uh, just uh, one point, because I don't really want to discuss that. Uh, like, I don't want to discuss the religion itself, but in, in Islam, the Quran says, don't be Christian, don't be uh, Jewish, just be one whole group. The idea of Islam was to reunite Christianity and, um, and uh, Judaism together, but it's, it's understood as don't be uh, Jewish, don't be Christian, just be a new religion, although that's not what, uh, what it's supposed uh, to mean, especially that, that Islam is telling people to believe in the existence of the other religions and the books they have, so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, AR says in Islam, it's forbidden to eat cloven hoofed animals and pigs are cloven hoofed animals, like in Judaism. Then maybe that's it. Why? But still there is the why behind the why. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, that's it for questions, I think. Okay, then we can uh, move to uh, the environment. Um, something also like a, a key value in Islam, and you would hear this a lot when people talk about uh, humans in Islam, that um, humans are uh, successors of God upon earth. Uh, so according to Islam, God created mountains, animals, humans, and then uh, God asked who wants to take over earth and take care of it and be a, a successor of God on, uh, on earth and only uh, a human being said yes. The other creatures uh, didn't take that responsibility. Um, so yeah, and I think if, if, if a human being is a successor on earth then also we should take care or Muslim people should also take care um, of the environment. And during the wars that Muslim led, uh, the Prophet Muhammad or uh, his uh, representatives always made sure that the army doesn't kill children, elderly people, women, animals. They weren't even allowed to cut trees. They were only uh, allowed to fight against the people who are taking part in the war. So the idea was that they have to, that they had to, um, how should I say, 
to take care of the place that they were having the fight in. And I think if the if the army in this in this time during wars weren't allowed to uh, destroy the environment, then what does that say about uh, a human being uh, who is not in a war situation? Um, yeah, and we know now for a fact that the um, the animal industry is responsible for uh, lots of damage to the environment. And uh, you can you can tell the person you're talking to. You can go and like walk them through these thoughts, these process, this process, and also uh, tell them why the animal industry is is destroying Earth and make make them make the connection uh, there. Um, and health. Also, um, sorry. But a couple of questions. Um, someone uh, from Sibel, someone told me that you can't eat the mom and the son in the same meal, like eat meat and drink milk. Is it a thing? Uh, that's uh, in Judaism, that's the kosher. Um, um, okay. It's not the same in Islam. You can eat, uh, you can eat milk and dairy, in the same, uh, dairy and meat in the same meal. Yeah. Lisa had um, a remark. Uh, I was thinking if trichinella could be the reason pork is haram. And that was also something I remember when the, the swine flu started and when they found also this disease, they, lots of Muslim people were saying, oh, this is why Islam tells us not to eat this. But we know that these diseases also are in other animals. So it might be it, it might be it, but it might be also something else or, yeah, at least this is what people think. They think they shouldn't eat pork. Mara says, um, yes, Muslims believe that humans have been assigned as stewards of the earth. Yeah. Which plays a major part in, in their lives. Okay. It just a remark for me, I think there are some people who are not unmuted, so if you please uh, mute yourself so there are no noises in the background. Is someone sleeping somewhere? Or is that a dog sleeping? <laughs> I think it's Veronique's cat. <laughs> ah, it's a cat, okay. <laughs> it's my cat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, then let's move on health. Um, also Muslim have to take care uh, of their selves and uh, of their health. Um, there is a, a verse in, in, in Quran that says that uh, human beings are not allowed to do anything that can put them in harm and um, or that can damage their health or their existence. And this is one of the verses that people use for example to say that smoking is should be forbidden because back to the time where Islam started, people weren't smoking, and there's nothing uh, talking about smoking in, in Quran, but people use this verse to say that um, smoking shouldn't be allowed because it's damaging. Um, so yeah, and uh, we know that <laughs> the animal products are bad for our health, um, so they should be avoided. Um, yeah, there are also some people that are, um, that have a big value in Islam, um, the the companions of the of the Prophet. Uh, so these are not saints. It's not like in Christianity where you have a saint. I don't really understand that hierarchy, but at least these are people that uh, nowadays that they get mentioned uh, because they did something important or they were known for something important and one of these people is Omar ibn Khattab who was uh, one of the or still is one of the most respected companions of the Prophet and uh, people are still mentioning him and mentioning what he said and he was known for his um, healthy lifestyle and also for being a good person in general and one of the things that he said uh, was for example that uh, white flour um, and sugar and salt should be avoided because they're bad for for uh, for our health and that was long years ago and we know that 
this is bad. And he also said that we should avoid meat because it's as addictive and as bad as alcohol. Um, so this is how I would also um, argue about um, about health and Islam and what Islam has to say about um, about veganism. Um, yeah, before we, let's do the recap and then talk about because this is the last part about Islam. So I hope that now you are able to see that Islam stands in favor of animal rights and veganism. It's actually encouraging people to go vegan um, and Muslims have to take care of animals and to protect animals, but also to protect their environment, to take care of their health and themselves. Um, the animals have to be treated well in Islam. This is what Islam is telling us. This, these are the rules that Muslim people should follow. Um, and I would dare to say that Muslim people have or must be vegan if they want to follow the rules of Islam to the fullest. I think if they if Muslim people would follow the rules of Islam, there would be nothing like the animal agriculture in Muslim countries. Um, and probably the same is applied for all other religions that we know. Um, yeah. And the, the next part that I'm going to talk about is because probably I look Muslim when I talk to people, I look Muslim, whatever. Most of you are probably European or in other countries that don't look or don't come across as Muslim. So we're going to talk about now that we know the arguments, how can I, as a person who is not Muslim or the person who doesn't read as Muslim, how can I, um, um, how can I tell these arguments? But before doing that, uh, let's talk about everything that we said now. If anything, if someone has anything to say, to say or to ask about Islam and uh, animal rights and all that. There were a couple of remarks. Um, AR says Christianity is founded by Petrus and at least Jesus was a Jew till he died. So Jesus don't eat pigs and fast, but the popes in the Middle Age loosened up the rules and allowed pork. And after the Reformation and the New Testament, a lot of rules changed and most Christians stopped to follow the rules of Old Testaments. Okay, interesting. And C. Mohammed says Muslims believe that they are the center of the universe and God has provided them with the universe, animals, nature, oceans, in order to serve their desires. And it's difficult to, cha to change them this idea. But we can try at least, right? <laughs> um, and sorry, Veronique, that's why I said that uh, Muslims are probably the hardest group at least that I, I had to deal with until now. Yeah. And Didier says, if I understood well, uh, Jew religion is controversial by themselves. I, can you clear, can you, Didier, Daniel, can you maybe explain that what you mean by that um, the islam religion what about it do you want maybe to open your mic and say what you want to say or is it, that's not an option for you Um, okay, lots of comments now that I see. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, I see. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Beam, for the correction. Oh, um, sorry. Um, Mara says the Prophet Muhammad's diet consisted mostly of dates and barley, so he was about 90% plant-based. 
Yeah, it, it was actually mentioned somewhere that he drank lots of milk and he ate lots of dates and he uh, ate lots of barley and that he was a, like kind of a semi-vegetarian. So uh, uh, he would eat meat only once per three months or something and that would be a small piece of meat. But yeah. Mia asks, um, if animals have to be killed according halal methods, how much does the modern slaughterhouses go according to halal rules? Um, most of the time that means um, um, the animal is facing to Mecca, they do that, they say that prayer and they, they just cut open the, the throat of the animal. So that's a good question, how much they do that? Eh, not really. That's what I said at the beginning, that there are th these two ways to, to argue about that, that what's happening today, even in, in uh, Muslim institutions, that it's not really, um, that it's not really uh, uh, aligning with the rules of Islam. And the other one is that uh, Islam is actually encouraging them to go vegan. Um, I see asks, uh, isn't Muhammad supposed to be a perfect moral example? So if he ate animals, then how can a Muslim not follow his example? 90% plant-based is still non-vegan. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Um, I would say that the way, the way he did it back to, the, back to the time is completely different. Um, he was he was making sure that he followed all of the rules that they mentioned. And nowadays it's quite difficult to, to, um, to fulfill these rules because starting from breeding animals, where are you going to find nowadays an animal that uh, just was brought in this world in a normal way that wasn't bred or that where the, the mother wasn't forcibly impregnated, right? So try to find try to find nowadays a, a perfect animal and try to be try to be also perfect about all the rules and then maybe we can talk and then just don't eat animals did i answer your question or what do you think about that okay great um see mohammed says not eating meat or sacrificing for the Eid al Adha holiday for them is a rebellion against God's commandments and they do not have the ability to discuss the matter logically. This will not serve the development of animal rights movement in the Islamic world. Yeah, that's the one argument that people would bring up. That's really the, the probably the toughest one. Um, but yeah. We can do our best. We can try to convince people with what we said here and do our best. We cannot force anyone to believe anything. It's, it's quite hard to be honest in the Muslim countries and Muslim communities to uh, spread veganism. But hey, um, there are lots of vegans who are Muslim and who are, um, yeah, there, there's always a hope. <laughs> Jordi says, I'm sorry to tell, but I think religion is just something made up by society to make us believe in something to keep us, the people, stupid and separated from each other so we can't unite together to fight the system. As I said in the beginning, we're not discussing religions, we're not discussing whether it's, it's uh, uh, right or wrong, we're discussing what people think and how we can deal with that to spread the message. Yeah, that may be another topic, uh, another discussion. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, Thorsten. Uh, he had to leave, but he thanks you, Malek. Oh, yeah. Malek. Um, um, he, I see. He says, uh, my main issue is the one you're going to cover next, namely how non-Muslims can cover the subject with Muslims and be taken serious as not being offensive. Yeah, let's have a look at that and hopefully we can find some, uh, we can find a way for us to, to do so because yeah, I, I understand uh, what, you, what you're saying. 
Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about emotions and body language. And um, I think that uh, spreading the vegan message and the animal rights message takes lots of courage and self-confidence and lots of good communication skills. And it's, 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 it's not easy. I think the art of communication is not easy. So to every one of you who is going on the streets or going online and talking to people, you are doing a great job, okay? It's not easy to talk to people about this, especially to strangers. So um, yeah, and all while being nice. And by nice, I don't mean the kind of nice where like, oh, it's okay to, uh, uh, to eat animals every now and then. I'm not talking about that kind of nice. I'm talking about the respectful kind of nice while smiling and being genuine with the other person. And I think it doesn't really matter if you're talking to a 10 year old person or an 80 year old person, a group of Muslim or teenagers or whatever, if you have the right wording and if that's the right body language and if you, if you choose your words and your gestures and your arguments wisely, then it doesn't really matter. Um, so I have, I have a, a question for you here um, for the non-vegans there. Please go vegan, inform yourself, watch Dominion or uh, what the health or whatever or contact me for more information. But for the rest of you, I would like to know why you're vegan. Who wants to start? <laughs> DJ, I don't know either. <laughs> um, Patricia. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, because of like post-veganism, I don't really identify myself as a vegan anymore. Okay. I more identify myself as animal rights activist or an animal ally. ally. And the reason why um, I am is because, well, I'm like against exploiting animals and um, I want to align that with my actions by um, not consuming animal products mm -hmm. um, and also um, not purchasing their flesh and also speaking up for them. Okay, thank you for sharing this. Thank you, Patricia. So yes. phrase it, instead of why are you vegan, why do you live animal cruelty free? Is that a better wording for everyone? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Uh, Susanna says, I'm vegan for the animals. I love animals. I want to protect them. I see says, moral coherence. Um, Beam, what, do you want to say something? Yeah, oh, sorry. I mean the same, it as, uh, means the same as I see. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think moral coherence, it means, um, that we have to be like same everywhere we have to have the same moral grounds for everything so there's no other way of doing that without without not eating animals and not hurting them and not hurting any other other beings in the world so okay thanks beam thank you um mara says i'm vegan for animal cruelty reasons and also i'm a muslim and i believe that being vegan aligns well with my faith thumbs up for you <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, Gary Allen says, I went vegan for the animals after being vegetarian for 10 years. I knew I had to do more. Okay. So is there anything else? Or I think most of the reasons that I'm hearing are like the environment, uh, animal rights, health, whatever, but uh, not whatever, it's, it's not valid. Okay. All reasons are valid. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm trying to say here is, um, what I want to address here is, why are we why are we thinking of animals why are we caring of animals if we are not actually um directly uh, um, influenced by that if the animals are being killed i am not the one who is dying uh, if the planet is i don't know what so i i want to know the why of the why i am vegan myself i am vegan I still identify as vegan, um, 
because of the animals, right? And although I killed animals myself, I don't want to support that because I am part of so many marginalized groups. This is one of them. Um, and, and I know how, how it means or how it feels like to be uh, discriminated against. And I don't want to, to do that to other people. So now, especially the people who, who just said, or maybe other people, I would like to know the why of the why. What is the emotion behind, uh, behind the reason that you just gave? You are vegan for the animals, you are vegan for the, for the planet, but why? Are you scared? Are you, do you know how it feels like to be, to be discriminated against and you don't want to do that? Uh, are you just, I don't know, what is the emotion behind, behind the reason that you just mentioned? Um, lots of comments. Um, humans are empathetic. It's wrong to kill me. It's wrong to kill human. And if it's wrong to kill any human, it's wrong to kill any animal. Um, yeah, empathy again. Compassion. Um, love and peace. Uh, yeah, compassion and Lisa wants to say something. Um, the reason I went uh, vegan was uh, that I was in shock. As a child, I could identify my food on the plate. Tomatoes, cucumber, potatoes and stuff. And when I asked what was in the other stuff, they told me, yeah, but that's lamb. I was like super shocked. I mean, you mean the lamb, the animal? And that was when I started asking million questions and never looked back. And I was, I don't even remember when, the, when I started asking questions, I was probably like six or seven. And now my son is doing the same. He has to eat meat at his dad's and they have big fights and I mean it shouldn't be an issue since I'm his mother and dad should know what it's all about but I mean for me it was the shock of learning that animals could even be considered as food mm -hmm. thank you very much for sharing that Thank you. Uh, I see says so sorry for your son. Um. I see. Um, okay. Uh, let me also rephrase it here if you don't uh, um, uh, agree or you don't resign with the word uh, emotion. What I, I mean by that, the why of the why, the reason behind that, if you found your reason, if you found that motivation and you I'm a very emotional person. That's why I talk about emotion. If that's something else for you, then just the why of the why. The why, okay, I'm vegan for the animals, I'm vegan for the environment, what's behind that? If for you, you have a, a philosophical way or whatever you, wanna, you want to call it, if you found that, that's what I'm going to address in a moment. Um, okay. As a meat eater, I don't understand the, the identify argument. If someone make a vegan lasagna, you can't identify the ingredients. Is the dealing with people of faith? Oh no, uh, it's the same if someone makes meat lasagna. Um, I don't really get the point, but whatever. Let's just uh, let's just move on. So try to find that 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 actual motivation for you. For me, as I just called it, it's the emotion, it's what's behind the reason for me. I don't want to kill animals, I don't want to because I know how it's like to be discriminated against. I don't want to put any harm because empathy, whatever you want to call it, because I, I am vegan for the, uh, an example, I'm vegan for the environment because I'm scared that people are gonna die. I'm scared that uh, I am going to eventually die because of the climate change. And I think this key emotion, thought, whatever, is the one that 
we should focus on. And this is the one that we should convey in our discussions. Um, and the other reason is, do you think that we are on the right side of history by fighting for the animals? Um, Maybe thumbs up if you think so, maybe thumbs down if you don't think so. Do you think that we are on the right side of history by fighting for the animals? Yeah, me too. I believe that strongly. Um, so don't doubt it and don't doubt yourself. We are, we are on the right side of history. We have, um, we have that, that motivation for ourselves and the, this is what, what we should keep and this is, this is something that should keep us motivated to, to uh, keep on going. So, um, as I said, wording, the, the way we use uh, or choose our words is very important. Um, how, we, how can we convey these arguments? And I have here <clears throat> three statements. And um, the first one is, I heard someone saying that the sky might be blue. The second one, I know for a fact that the sky is blue. And the third one, look at the sky, which color do you see? First of all, uh, it's just the, the example that I thought of. I'm sorry if uh, someone cannot see the sky or cannot see the colors. I'm very sorry for that. That wasn't my intention. Um, what do you think of these? Um, how, how, do you, how do you see them? Anyone uh, can say something about that? Okay, um, if anyone, if no one wants to say something about that. Um, three, yeah. Um, anyway, so I think the first one is, um, is, is um, I don't think that, that if someone comes to you and tells you, oh, look, that might be looking like, I don't know what, if, if you don't, if you choose your words in a way that it's not, um, Oh, the question just was, what do you think of these three statements? And uh, I'm just, uh, yeah. I didn't ask my first in mind. He could describe ways better the sky than all of us. But anyways, I don't want to offend anyone. So let's just uh, keep on going. So I think the first one, you're just showing, uh, you're just showing that you are not confident enough, uh, that your also argument is not based on something, um, something great. Maybe the second one, uh, if you say, I know for a fact that the sky is blue, and then you support your statement by, um, by some science or whatever you, or maybe by an experiment or whatever, then you, you can show the person that the sky is blue. And the third one, as probably most of us know, the way we ask a question, makes the people think and makes them uh, make the connection by themselves. And I think in general, when we talk to people, um, we should avoid the first one because it doesn't, I don't think it comes across well. And I think we should focus on the second and the third one. Um, so maybe a mixture of, okay, um, you can do also an example now. Um, uh, if two people here want to discuss something and let's relate it to, to, to Islam, maybe is, uh, you, Someone comes to you and say, I don't want to uh, uh, stop eating animals because my religion says that uh, I can't eat it. I can't eat animals. So what would be your response to that? Could you repeat, uh, Malik, as Patricia asks? So what I was saying is, uh, we should, from these three statements, I think we should, uh, um, we should avoid the first one and focus on the two second ones. So uh, try to uh, uh, ask a question to the person, let them respond to that and build upon that by making a statement like the second one and then asking them a question again. So for example, someone comes to me and says, hey, um, halal rules, um, I, I, I am allowed to eat animals uh, because these are halal. I would ask them, um, what are the halal rules? They would probably say, um, yeah, they should face uh, Mecca and then uh, uh, you should say that prayer and then kill them. And then I would say, yes, that is correct. And also there, there are these rules. And, the, and I would state that. So I would make a mixture of the question 
and the statement, and I think this just applies for, for all the um, um, conversations we can have. Yeah, Patricia asks, oh, sorry. I thought you were finished, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, Patricia asks, uh, do you mean Socratic methods? Um, kind of. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of only questions because at some point the person is going to feel that they are in a questionnaire somehow they're going to the police station and they're getting only questions. So that's why I mix between asking questions and then building uh, on the response of the other person by uh, um, um, uh, stating a statement, by making a statement and then I would talk that and then ask another question. Yes, questions are important, Socratic method is great, but if you do it the whole time, I don't think it's a great idea. And I see you have a question. Um, well, I was um, uh, just sort of going to answer, like when Malik asked something a minute ago, but sort of, you know, and it's moved on slightly, but um, sort of related to that and about like, because I, I do like just asking questions in general, but there are some people who really don't like just being asked questions. Mm -hmm. And I think quite a, a disproportionately big proportion of those people are quite often visitors from Muslim countries okay. because I'm just guessing in the in the education they've been brought up in or the society it just it has a different effect so you know young Muslims in London it's not any different to, to talking to anyone else in that regard but certain slightly older people who are visiting London there's great resistance to sort of having things drawn out of them in that way so mm -hmm. I, I think yeah they the Socratic method it, like you were saying just doesn't um it doesn't work so well as with some people Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Also, it, it reminded me that I also have the same, the same, uh, or have been in the same situation. And uh, maybe it's different for me because I have the background. But um, I forgot what I wanted to say. But uh, yeah, I, I don't bring up the the, uh, the topic of Islam directly. I wait for the other person to bring it up so I can uh, build that upon everything else that they said. Because if I made them realize that the animals have feeling that animals are um, 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 worth living and then we talk about Islam and then I talk, tell them hey but you said they they uh, deserve life and we can build upon that uh, or on that so yeah again a reminder don't start talking about religion unless the other person talks about it I, I, I find it quite um, offending when even when I watch some outreach videos, uh, like you see a person that looks Muslim and they start talking about Islam. So, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, also something very important, watch, the, <laughs> watch, watch your voice tone. tone. Um, don't tell someone, I don't know. I, I think it's clear, right? Don't you don't want to come across as aggressive. You don't want to come across. Uh, you don't want to offend the other person by um, raising your tone and being grumpy to them while telling them something nice. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there are some comments in there, but okay. Also, okay, now it's the time for me to stand up. Um, I'm going to show you something. I don't know if the camera is going to help me here. Uh, I hope so. But maybe you can see it. Um, what do you think about people that are going to be saying something like, oh, um, Islam is actually encouraging us to, uh, to go vegan. And um, yeah, you should go vegan. What do you think of that poster? On the spot. It's written everywhere, right? <laughs> um, I think I see has a remark or a question. Um, uh, yeah, two things actually, because one is the same as um, what I think Marva has just said. That yeah, there's also lots of issues to do with um, uh, halal and what is the reality of what is legally halal in the UK versus the true definition of halal. But what I was just saying, the question for then is, um, is it possible to go? Um, to put the, I don't know how to say it, so that Malik, for example, is in the big screen instead of uh, the text slide. Oh, um, uh, okay, maybe I should, okay, let's do it, let's do it this way. Especially when there's not much text there, yeah. 
now now you, you you see me on the big screen right you don't see me on the small screen yeah because before okay. when you stood up you were a very very little person really, so i couldn't really see what you were doing i didn't think of that okay so what i was doing is i was talking about animal rights and i was doing this um and i'm trying to tell people that animal rights uh, are encouraged by islam and that you should take care of animals and uh yeah this was that uh could you see that Okay. Sorry, I muted. Yes, I could see it that time very well. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, Eve says that's. Uh, I think the sky maybe is blue. Kind of posture. <laughs> that's a good one. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, what I was trying to say is avoid crossing legs. But I, I, everything that I'm going to say is. I think that I also did myself. So no, don't drag yourself down if you do them. Just keep them in mind when you talk to people. Don't cross your legs. Don't uh, keep swinging back and forth and being like all jumpy and whatever. Um, and try to face the other person. Don't talk to the person like what I'm doing right now, not facing to you because I have to look to the screen. Um, <laughs> also, Try to lower your shoulder and relax. Just be, show that you are confident. Show that what you are going to say, uh, that you strongly believe in that and that you are very confident saying whatever argument you are trying to say. Um, mind your distance to the other person. I think as human animals, we know when the other person or we are uncomfortable with the distance that we're leaving between the person we're talking to and ourselves. It's actually very interesting because when I do the, the workshop in real life, I get someone to stand up and then I get really close to them to the point that it's really uncomfortable for both of us. <laughs> uh, but very, still, still politically correct, still politically correct, but um, yeah. Uh, but also don't overdo it. Don't be like a, like a machine that are trying to lower your shoulders, facing the person and being greedy like a robot because you just want to relax and you just because if you i think if you overdo it you you look like a little bit unapproachable and not that friendly um yeah the second one the hands the hands i think are the most difficult ones you don't know what to do with the hands okay i'm north african i'm mediterranean i tend to talk a lot with my hands right uh, but usually when you're talking to a person you don't know what to do with them you put them in your pockets you put, you put them behind you but you shouldn't do that at all. Um, also, yeah, there's something very important. So maybe let me stop the, the screen again. So maybe you can see me now uh, better. Let's, let's say you just met a person and they come to you and tell you, let's talk about women's rights today. And they, and they do this. How would you feel about that? So that's what I'm trying to say. You're not in a fight. Um, okay, Peter wants to say something. Yeah. Um, if I saw someone doing that, I'd like wonder why they're doing it and want to ask them why they're doing it, but then also not want to ask because I think maybe they have some something that makes them do that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so what I'm trying to say here is don't like, don't talk to people while trying to, to like, hit them with your, with your fist. Um, let, your, let the other person talk to you. It's something very interesting that I read recently. Uh, it was a psychological based uh, article where they said, if people see the palm of your hand, they... Um, uh, they um, they tend to to trust you more because they see the palm of your hand. They see that you don't have a weapon that you're not gonna kill them. Uh, so at, somewhere we're still very primitive in a way. Uh, so yeah, why are all of you showing your hands? What's going on in the chat? <laughs> Somebody was leaving. So ah, okay, bye. Whoever the person was. <laughs> um, so yeah, try to show the person your, the palm of your hands, that you don't have a weapon, you're not going to kill them. 
also avoid crossing arms or crossing fingers because for some people for some people it feels natural and it fe if it feels natural for you then please do it but most of the times if you're talking to a person and you're crossing your arms i don't think um that it treats as um comfortable and as confident um yes also don't put your hands on your in, on behind your back or in your pockets i don't I don't think it's it comes across uh nice also um have ever wondered why Angela Merkel always holds her hand in front of her belly? That's, uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So usually when she talks, when she talks, she, she has this very iconic posture when she, she always talks like that. Her hands are always like this. Um, yeah. Anyways, it actually has been shown that uh, when you when you put your your uh, hands in front of your belly area, and you you still do that, so the people see in front of your of your hand, then they they trust you. And apparently, this is the most um, confident way to put your hands. Uh, and so, apparently, Angela Merkel chose that for a reason. Uh, I think this is the last one, uh, the face. Um, it's very. Sorry, oh. but I see had a a hand a, a question. Um, I have asked one ex-Muslim activist this before, and he said yes. But should I offer my hand to a Muslim woman at the end of conversations? I shake hands at the end of all conversations. I think yes too, but a small number refuse, and I don't want to offend them by offering even offering my hand. Um, yeah, maybe avoid that. Avoid shaking hands. Uh, if okay, um, I'm no by no mean I am uh, trying to be a binary person here. But if you read as man, probably don't shake the hand of a woman. If you read as woman, probably don't shake the hand of man. Just to be on the on the on the safe side, because yeah, usually you're not allowed in Islam to touch uh, the other gender person although yeah i'm no by me no non-binary i'm sorry for that yeah um okay the last one the face it's um at first i think the face tells a lot about about us about the what we feel about what we think but it's also a little bit difficult to control <laughs> it's exactly exactly like dj is doing right now um, I think for, for a couple of really microseconds, maybe you cannot, uh, you cannot control your face and you do faces without really uh, uh, um, knowing that you're doing that. So try your best to control your face, like not to talk to people and be like, what the hell are you saying? So just try to be as respectful as you can with your face. Um, and yeah, try to relax, try to look in, in, in your um, counterpart's eyes. If you cannot do that, this is always a good area to look at here, just above the eyebrows. They wouldn't even notice that you're not looking in their eyes. Um, and yeah, keep a genuine smile because usually that reads as, uh, I am confident, I know what I'm talking about and I'm nice. <laughs> and okay, what's going on here? Okay, I think, that was it for body language and how to convey these arguments. So just to recap, maybe um, remember that you're on the good, in, on the right side of the history, that you are doing uh, something great, and that you know what you're talking about, and try to use these um, tips for body language to to show that or to convey that you're confident and uh, hopefully you are able to um, convey the, the arguments better and to hopefully also convince the other person. Okay. Um, how about kissing on the cheek? Is that accepted in Islamic culture? Ah, okay, from I'm from Tunisia, for example, I kiss my, uh, my aunt, my cousin, my friends, I hug them, that's not a problem. In Tunisia, at least in the, in the city I live in, 
in others it's a little bit more difficult so you cannot say in islamic cultures if it's okay or not but uh yeah are you thinking about just kissing someone on the cheek that you just met on the street if you are willing to do that please go go ahead do it self-confidence would be the one right like the rest is uncertain right Yes. Mm -hmm. What I'm a sign demonstration, I never know where to lay my eyes on. Should I look at the people who pass by in the eyes or not look at them? Um, is it too challenging and uncomfortable for the people passing if they look at them in the eyes? Well, again, what are you trying to say? If you're trying to challenging the person, maybe looking them, uh, looking them in the eyes, and staring at them, maybe that would make them take you more seriously, if that's what you're going for. Um, if you want to still read as uh, really non-violent, non-pushy or non-challenging, maybe just keep a, a genuine smile and maybe just have a small eye contact with that person and then uh, look over. Yeah, of course, you can keep always the eye contact with the person without, uh, with a, in an aggressive way. That's 100% sure. Yeah, there's a, a difference between looking at them that way and really staring at them with open eyes and like, I am here to challenge you. Again, the facial expression, right? <laughs> yes, you're correct, I see. Okay, um, the last points that I didn't know where to put them exactly. Uh, the first one, if you speak any language, please use that language. Even if you know how to say go vegan in I don't know which language and you're in a situation where you can say them, please use them. English is for me not a native language. I live in, I live in Germany. It's not my German is not my native language and still do, I do lots of mistakes when I speak and that's okay because it's not my mother tongue. And every one of us is allowed to make mistakes in any language, even if in our mother tongue. So use whatever it takes you to, to, to talk about animal rights in whatever language you can speak or you were willing to speak. Okay, uh, make people feel that you feel what they're feeling and that you understand where they're coming from and about their background. Um, if people resonate with people that, um, if I feel that the other person understands where I'm coming from and has feelings for what I'm feeling, then probably I'm gonna resonate with that person better and I'm gonna to listen to them uh, more. Body language, uh, yeah, get, of your, get out of your comfort zone and fake it till you make it. And although I don't live by that motto, I don't agree with fake it till you make it, but I think when it comes to body language, you can fake it a little bit until you can make it, you can also um, uh, uh, practice that by yourself at home. Um, yeah. Also learn, learn to stop a conversation. I know sometimes we want to say everything we want to say because we know everything, we know all the arguments, but we cannot stop it. Sometimes we have to stop because it's either going to harm us, it's not going to bring anything to the other person and uh, we have to take care of ourselves, right? So if you see that the conversation is not going anywhere, stop it. Learn to say no. Learn to say, I don't want to talk about this any longer. Um, please do that. Take care of yourselves, people, okay? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, anyone here is a, is a, a fan of shaming. Uh, but this uh, saying that I heard uh, from uh, from uh, um, uh, an activist, an animal rights activist from Cologne here in Germany, uh, who is actually really great, uh, she said that shaming starts when outreach ends. So if you're talking to someone um, and they don't understand what you're going and they try to offend you, then you can start shaming them for one specific point. Um, she's a big advocate for first shaming, for example, or shaming people who are treating animal, uh, uh, in a bad way, animals in a bad way on the street, so that she would approach them and ask them, hey, uh, do you know that this is happening? She would just start, start a conversation, and if they, if they push her away, she starts shaming them and focusing on that one point. She wouldn't tell them you're a bad person. She would tell them you are harming the animal. Um, and something, shaming is something 
really, really out of my comfort zone. But once you do it, I think it brings a lot. I mean, you know that uh, fur was banned in in, uh, in one of the states, I think in California, right? Because people were shaming other people, right? Um, yeah, also the conditions that animals live in, in in Muslim countries, or at least in, in Tunisia and in other Arabic countries, that they are they are different, but they are still very comparable uh, to to what's happening in Europe and uh, and other countries. Um, it's still quite traditional in some in some countries. It's sometimes modern. Um, still, people are not eating as much meat as here. It depends on the country, of course but it's not that different. Um, I had, a, I know a, um, a, a friend of mine from Tunisia is studying, I forgot how he said, veterin veterinary, I don't know how it's called, medicine for animals, I don't know. Anyways, uh, she, she had to do um, uh, an internship um, and she told me that what you see in Dominion is the same in Tunisia. So don't think that it's different in Tunisia because we say that it's only happening in the in the western world um yeah the best time to start was yesterday and the second best time to start is today and by that i mean if you have any project that you want to start if you want to do anything if you want to start a youtube channel if you want to go do something outside then start today because today is the best day it's the best or actually yesterday was the best time today is the best day um also do it before you're ready uh if you want to do like say again a youtube channel and you say oh but i don't have a software i don't have a camera no just start it start it before you're ready and the last one is please take care of yourself and all of you are doing a great job and you deserve love and you're enough and that's it for me uh yeah these are if you want to follow me on instagram facebook youtube uh you can find me at the tunisian vegan and if you want to make a donation one-time donation you can also use that paypal uh link uh 